Okay, good morning everybody, let's get started. This whole course is about how amazing it is to have a body, how it supports intelligence, but sometimes having a body is a bit of a drag, like having to walk into class this morning, so I'm glad you all made it. Um, just a reminder of where we are and where we're going. We are gonna finish up our first uh, theme of the course, introduction and overview. We've done a crash course on the history of AI, and we're dipping our toes into this concept of embodied cognition exactly how the body scaffolds or supports uh, increasingly cognitive behavior. And we're doing so in lecture three uh, last time and today by looking at some of the building blocks of intelligence and various approaches over the years to tackle that building block of intelligence in a non-embodied way and in an embodied way. We'll finish that up in a few minutes and then we'll move on to a much more nuts and bolts uh, part of the course where we're gonna go through the three main tools that you're gonna be using in, these, in this first month, month and a half, to build up your evolutionary robotics code base, which is artificial neural networks, the brains inside your robot, uh, evolutionary algorithms, the search method or the optimization process that you're gonna to use to tune the artificial neural network of your robot, and then obviously your robot is gonna live inside an increasingly interesting virtual world. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time probably next week, towards the end of next week, talking about physical simulation and what PyBullet is actually doing uh, under the hood. There's the attendance sheet. Uh, you're working your way through assignment two. Uh, Krishna, the TA, alerted me to there's a bit of an issue on the subreddit. Can you say something about that, Krishna? Yeah, so some of the YouTube links, uh, they're uh, fighting by Okay, thanks, Krishna. Yes, question. How do you know if your link? <laughs> if it doesn't, Krishna will let you know, and he'll just ask for your YouTube link, link directly. If you see that your Reddit post gets deleted, you can submit. You can submit in Blackboard either the Reddit link or the YouTube link directly. I think that's that's perfectly so fine. The post is alive. Yep. But there's no link. The post is alive, but there's no YouTube there's link. It removes it. Okay. So obviously, as as Krishna and I are grading, if if we don't see something, we'll ask you for it. Okay, any other questions about logistics, how the assignments are going, how the course is going? All good? Okay, so back to the fun stuff. Uh, embodied cognition. We ended last time with this small matter of determining whether we all have free will or not. This is not a philosophy of mind course. The reason we are talking about the Libet experiment here is this is probably the best reminder that thinking about thinking is misleading. Anytime over the entire history of AI and robotics, someone sits down to try and create an intelligent machine, it is very difficult not to be guided by your intuition. We all have a first person view of what it's like to be a cognitive thinking being in the world. But what it feels like and what you think you're doing may not actually be what you're doing. Like, for example, in the Libet experiment, where subjects were asked to watch a second hand moving around the face of a clock and to remember the exact point in time in which they freely decided to move their finger. EEG and EMG reported, uh, the EEG seemed to concur with people's reporting of what time they chose to move their finger. So m most people were behaving and doing what they were asked to do in the experiment. When it was 17 seconds past uh, the minute, there was a particular EEG pattern that showed up for that particular human subject, and it correlated with another particular pattern two tenths of a second later, 200 milliseconds later from EMG that they actually did move their finger. So they were faithfully reporting when they decided to move their finger, and they actually tried to move their finger at exactly that point in time, and it takes about two tenths of a second for the signal to go from the brain to the finger. The very surprising thing about the Libet experiment was that there was another EEG pattern that always showed up for each human subject that correlated with the pattern that showed up at the moment they decided to move their finger. So who was deciding to move their finger? Was it their consciousness? Was it their subconsciousness? If your subconscious is, is deciding for you, are you free to decide? As we ended last time, there is a huge literature that has grown up around the Libet experiment trying to disprove it. There are many, many experiments that also confirm the Libet experiment. 
There are, some, uh, there are a few studies that show that there are brain patterns that seem to correlate with the point in time in which you think you freely chose to move your finger. And that pattern shows up not 300 milliseconds earlier, but seconds earlier. Curiouser and curiouser. Okay. Whether or not we have a free will or not, we will not debate that in this course. Just remember as we go, thinking about thinking is misleading. We talked about shaky last time. If you think about, if you introspect about how you choose to leave this classroom when we finish class, you would probably arrive at something like, you think about it, you look around the room, you decide how to get out of the chair, and off you go. Is that really what you're doing? Back in the 1970s, they implemented that because it seemed intuitive, but in retrospect, it's not a great solution because in the case of Shakey, Shakey spends 99% of his time standing there modeling and planning what to do. Even with modern 2022 electronics, you don't want your autonomous car uh, stopping and thinking about what to do before it decides what to do. So in the late 1980s, uh, Rod Brooks, who was the director of the AI lab at MIT at that time, militated against shaky and all of what has now become known as good old-fashioned AI, or GoFi for short. Good old-fashioned AI is a bit of an epithet, uh, and it's meant to be a snide comment on this idea of introspecting and then writing down what seems uh, intuitive. So Rod Brooks came along and said, let's do things differently. We don't want our machines to be sitting quietly and cogitating. Most animals and humans are constantly in motion. Even when you're sitting quietly in the classroom, your body is constantly moving. Your eyes are saccading. The muscles are pulling on your eyes, and your eyes are jumping from there to here to elsewhere in the classroom. You're always in motion. How do we create a robot that's useful that is also always in motion? Brooks sat down uh, with some of his grad students and eventually came up with what has been known as the subsumption architecture. And the subsumption architecture works as follows. There are a number of basic behaviors like avoid obstacles, avoid obstacles, avoid loud noises, follow the light and explore. And some of these behaviors are tagged as being more important uh, than others. Avoiding obstacles is probably the most important one if you're a robot. If you're driving around or flying around in the world, the last thing you want to do is crash into an obstacle. So in the subsumption architecture, the avoid obstacle is the primary behavior. And most of the time, that particular behavior grabs onto the sensors and grabs onto the motors. So in the case of the avoid obstacle behavior module, it needs information from the obstacle sensors. Those could be laser rangefinders, they could be bump sensors, depends on the robot. It takes that uh, obstacle information and uh, obstacle sensor data and then drives the motor. So if it gets bumped on the left, it turns to the right. If it gets bumped on the right, it turns to the left. That doesn't allow it to necessarily avoid obstacles, but at least turn away from an obstacle if it happens to hit it. What does that remind you of? Bumped on the right, turn to the left. Bumped on the left, turn to the right. Sound familiar? Breitenberg vehicle. So Breitenberg had written his book a few years before this. So basically what is in each, shot, each of these behavioral modules is its own, uh, its own Breitenberg vehicle. Yep, okay. If, uh, if there are no obstacles, so if none of the bump sensors are firing, the uh, robot is not in contact with the sensors, then one of the slightly less important behaviors can subsume or take over control of the sensors and motors. So as long as you're not hitting anything, you're free to do other things. What's the next most important thing is avoid loud, loud noises. If you're in a room full of humans that are talking and you're trying to clean the floor, if you start to hear a loud sound on your left, turn to the right because you don't want to bump into the, hu the human on your left. If there's loud sounds on your right, turn to your left. 
So you can think of the subsumption architecture as a bunch of these modules that are grabbing and then uh, releasing the sensors and motors. So we've got this particular behavior, avoid loud noise, which is S subsuming control of the sensors and motors. If there's no loud noise, if both of the noise sensors on the front left and front right of the robot are below a certain decibel threshold, you're not hitting anything, there's no loud noises nearby, you can do other stuff like follow the light. If there's more or less uniform light, explore your environment, see what else uh, is out there. The important thing to notice about the subsumption architecture is there's no modeling, there's no planning. There is a direct connection between sensors and motors at all time. Who or what is controlling the sensors and motors changes over time, but a robot programmed with the subsumption architecture is always in motion, and it is seamlessly changing what it does from time to time. As I mentioned, Rod Brooks, who uh, formulated the subsumption architecture, he was the director of the AI lab. Uh, he gave up his uh, post, probably the most coveted post in all of AI and robotics, and what went off to found uh, a robotics company called iRobot, and iRobot's most famous product is the Roomba. How many people have a Roomba at home? A couple people. Okay, this. This is what is running inside the Roomba. Just before Brooks left MIT, he was thinking about what would be a good practical application of this. A very simple robot that should avoid obstacles, av avoid loud sounds like a growling dog or a hissing cat, uh, move about, follow the light, and if there's no light or uniform light, move uniformly across the floor. Sounds like a great recipe for uh, an autonomous vacuum cleaner. Both computers and robots were invented at the end of the Second World War. Computers are now everywhere. Depending on how you count, we have a grand, grand total of one useful, autonomous, and adaptive robot in common use, and it's the vacuum cleaner. Robotics is really hard compared to computers, and hopefully you're starting to get a sense for why robotics is much more difficult than computers. Man never enters the same river twice. Okay, so uh, embodied cognition, you've seen some examples uh, at the moment. There is often a lot of de debate about what exactly the body that makes up an intelligent machine is. What is embodied and what isn't? All computer code is imprisoned in some physical object in some way, but that just because there is some code running inside a physical object does not mean that physical object like the computer case qualifies as a body. For our purposes in this course, all of the animals, humans, and robots we're going to look at, we're going to assume that they are embodied if they can use their physical, uh, their physical aspect to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. You're going to get sick of hearing me say that. That's the key, right? Your smartphone and some computers are getting a little bit better at pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. Your smartphone has a couple of motors on board. What do those motors do on your phone? They vibrate, right? So they can push against you, more or less literally, and they can observe how the world pushes back. How so? What sensors do your smartphones have? Camera sensor, accelerometer. accelerometer, right? So portrait landscape mode. So if your phone vibrates and suddenly it, the accelerometer data starts changing, in theory, your phone can know that you responded. Remember BabyBot that was sort of pushing against the world and seeing how the world pushes back? Your phone can do this to a small extent. We'll see how the internet of things pans out. We'll see what the next generation of smartphones do. Very simply, we often sort of create categories. All of these things are non-embodied, AI, machine learning, neural networks, everything on this side is embodied. Robots, organisms, xenobots, drones, autonomous cars. However, there is of course a gradient. You can be more or less embodied. If you have more ways of pushing against the world and observing how the world uh, pushes back. Okay. There are a lot of repercussions of being embodied. If you can push and observe the repercussion, you can get immediate feedback from the world. 
What are some examples of machines that move and sense immediate sensory repercussions? If your phone vibrates to let you know that you have a message and a second or two later you pick it up, okay, that's not instantaneous. What are some examples of instantaneous repercussions? Gas pedal on a car, okay, yep. Most of your ability to push against the world and observe the world pushes back is instantaneous. The moment I move my eyes, the pattern of photons falling on my retina changes. The moment I walk around the room, some of you in the back row become occluded and some of you become unoccluded. We are used to, most of the time, acting on the world and getting immediate feedback. Okay. Non-embodied technologies, they can sort of ask us to do stuff, they can vibrate, they can uh, send out a sound as an alert, but often computers and non-embodied technologies are passive. They're waiting from, for some input from us, or they're waiting from pa for packets from the internet. An important distinction as we move forward. Related to embodied cognition is a concept known as situated cognition. Situated cognition has more to do with the sensor side of a machine or the sensorium of an organism. We are situated in the world. If the flow of information out there in the world, if we are detecting that uh, in real time. So situated cognition is the idea that the way you process information coming in through your sensors is affected by the fact that you exist uh, in the world. So a great example of a device that is situated but not embodied is an intelligent sensor. So over in the Davis Center, some of the rooms up there on the top floor, if there's no one moving around in that room for a while, the lights will be shut off. Those embedded sensors, they can sense what's happening in real time. They're looking for motion. I guess they're embodied in a little bit in the sense that they can flick the lights on and off. But embedded sensors have limited bodies. They have limited ability to push against the world. But they're observing the world in real time. OK. We're assuming that in a situated uh, agent, number two here, that the information that's coming in is not sort of under the control of the system. That information is washing over the device and it's collecting as little or as much of that information as it can. We're not waiting for something to change. So a computer, for example, uh, has, data within, uh, has data within and that information isn't really changing internally unless it's explicitly changed by the computer itself. Most computers have a buffer. There's information that's stored and it's processing it bit by bit. A situated agent has direct contact with the world. Information is flowing over it directly. In this course, we're going to talk about complete agents. And a complete agent is an, is an animal, a human, or a robot that is both embodied and situated. It can sense incoming information. It's situated. And it can also push against the world. It's embodied. And because it's both embodied and situated, it can sense the repercussions of those actions. It can sense, for example, yep, question? What is something that's embodied but not Something that is embodied but not situated. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to, uh, we're going to, come back to that in one slide. Great, great question. OK. OK. So, because, uh, in complete agents, uh, because they are both embodied and situated, again, they have a number of these features. And one of the things that Mother Nature has done over billions of years is exploit that fact to tweak the bodies and brains of organisms so that their physical nature helps them exhibit whatever adaptive behavior they need to perform to survive. In evolutionary robotics, we're going to try and do the same thing. We are going to tweak the brains of our robots, and in some cases, the bodies of our robots, so that this ability to push against the world and, and sense the repercussions of that action, we're going to indirectly sculpt that feedback loop. We can alter how that loop plays out based on the body and brain of the robot, and we're going to sculpt it so that that feedback loop allows robots to, to more easily exhibit adaptive and possibly intelligent behavior. In the reading for today, 
uh, you'll see that there's a discussion of five aspects of complete agents. We're going to focus on just the first three in this course. If you have a physical body in the physical world, or if you have a physically simulated body in a physically uh, realistic virtual world, you are subject to the laws of physics, either the physics of the real world or the physics of pi bullet. What's some examples of that? What are some examples of, uh, of the real world acting on you physically that you exploit to get the job done, to get through your day? Momentum and inertia. We're going to spend a fair bit of time later in this course talking about biomechanics. All of biomechanics in animals and increasingly in robotics pays heed to that fact. When you leave the class today, pay attention to the way in which you leave the class and walk down the hallway and walk to the next building. Bipedal locomotion is one of the most energy efficient ways you can move because the moment your leg leaves the ground, and it becomes known as the swing leg at that point, all of the muscles in your leg go slack and your leg becomes a pendulum. You are no longer using energy in your swing leg and the momentum and inertia of your, your forward momentum will obviously swing your swing leg forward. And whether you realize it or not, you're walking most of the time at a comfortable gait. That gait is comfortable because it's just fast enough and just slow enough that your heel will strike at just the right angle. The moment your heel strikes, you tense your thighs and your calves, you stiffen your leg, and you rock your body over your stance leg your other leg leaves the ground, and the muscles in your leg go slack. If you pay attention to it, you can actually feel this happening. Half of the time, uh, half, or all of the time, one of your legs is relaxed, and the other is tensed. It's incredibly energy efficient. The evolution of bipedal locomotion was all about discovering exactly how to get that system right to exploit the fact that our legs are physical and have mass and have momentum and inertia and so on. Okay, as we move, we generate sensory stimulation and some of that self-generated sensory stimulation, again, is useful fodder for getting us through the day, for helping us grapple with the world. What are some examples of that? Uh, being able to see. Being able to see, how so? Can you be a little more specific? Absolutely. So obviously we are mostly visual creatures. That's why computer vision has been such an important part of AI for the last few decades. We can see. Seeing is an active process. If you think about what you're doing right now, you might have described it as passively sitting there and letting the photons from the projector uh, and from up here fall passively on your eyes. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Seeing is a very active process. Every tenth of a second or so, your eyes are saccading. Your eyes are jumping from one focal point to another. And as you do, your visual field changes, which allows you to obviously see what's going on around you. But the nature of the change in your visual field as you jump from point to point in your visual field, that what is it about the change that helps? We could, in theory, have evolved to passively look and not move our eyes, and you could still see, but we can see better by moving our eyes. What is it about the motion? The self-stimulated change in what you see that helps you grapple or reason with the world around you. It helps you develop better perception, right? Absolutely, right? It is obvious that you are looking at a three-dimensional scene, right? But you are not. There are two two-dimensional sheets of photons raining onto your retinas at any given point in time. You are actually picking up a two-dimensional scene, but it doesn't feel like that. It's obvious that you're looking at a three-dimensional scene. Why? How is saccading helping you with that? How do I know that the folks in the back row are further away from me than the folks in the front row? Oh, 
Okay, yep, so th yep, so there's so the faces up the front are larger than the ones in the back, but I don't need active vision for that. I could in theory just say bigger faces are closer. What's happening as my eyes jump around to various faces in front of me? Ah, right? So we have stereo vision. I'm actually seeing slightly different angles of your faces as my eyes jump around to the faces in front of me. As I jump from one of you to the next, the faces in the back actually jump further in my field of view when I saccade than the ones that are in close, closer. I am not aware of any of all of that machinery going on. There's dozens and hundreds of those kinds of mechanisms that are going on that my brain is picking up on and using to convince the rest of my brain that I'm actually looking at a three-dimensional scene. It works so well that it's hard to, to turn it off, to realize, to actually try and suppress it or introspect about it. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay. As you move about in the environment, you not only change your own perception, but you literally change the physical environment. How do animals or possibly machines exploit that fact for adaptive behavior? As you move about in your world, you, you leave metaphoric and literal traces in the environment. How do we exploit that fact to get through our day? Exactly, right? I'm glad that this particular slide comes up at this point uh, in the year, especially today. You are focused on getting to the next building as quickly as humanly possible. And if the snow is thick enough, you want to follow the trails that others have left, right? We're a social species. We do these, that kind of stuff all the time. We'll talk about ants a little bit later. They have mastered the craft of leaving pheromones or chemical signals in their environment that others pick up on. And by doing that, ants can do some pretty amazing things at very large scales without having massive brains. They are exploiting their embodied and situatedness to, as a colony, as a group, do some pretty amazing things, right? So embodiment and situatedness is not just there and something to fight against. It's raw material that animals have evolved to exploit and in this course, we're going to try and learn how to design machines to exploit these features to make it easier for the machine to get through its day and do whatever it is that it has to do. OK, so there was a question about embodied but non-situated agents. So just to reinforce this idea of embodiedness and situatedness, let's walk through the various cells here. What are some examples of disembodied and non-situated Machines. Uh, a chess AI. A chess AI, right? So anything that's kind of imprisoned inside a computer that's waiting for us to give information, and it sends out some numbers and relies on someone or something else to turn those numbers into physical actions in the world, right? So desktops, laptops. Chess AI, naked neural networks, those are all non-embodied and non-situated machines. With the exceptions of smartphones and laptops, they've got a few sensors and motors on them these days, but mostly they're non-embodied and non-situated. Situated but non-embodied. What are some examples? Things that are picking up the real-time flow of information or physical phenomenon out there in the world, but they have limited or no ability to act on the world. A toaster? Okay. Yep. That's good. I guess it's sensing when your toast is done. Yep. Like one of those thermostats that auto controls the temperature. Okay, a thermostat. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, it's sensing, but it's also kind of acting, right? Again, it's minimally cog cognitive. It's turning on and off the heater. Your toaster is popping up the toaster. It's not. Uh, security camera. Security camera. The camera is a great example, right? It's recording. It has a few motors. Some of them have a few motors. They can sw swivel, but again, very limited in terms of embodiment. Yes? Cat card sensor. Great example. Yep, absolutely. It can unlock the door. So again, minimum... Minimal embodiment, yep. 
great examples of situated but non-embodied devices. Incredibly useful, but we're not going to spend a lot of time in this course talking about them because they don't have rich ways of pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. Let's do the bottom right, embodied and situated. We've mentioned a few already. The Roomba, yep, great. Other examples? You, you're embodied and situated. Every organism on the planet is situated and embodied. Other examples? Self-driving cars. Self cars, absolutely. They act in and on the world in important ways. The virtual robot that you're building at the moment, you're going to instrument it with sensors and motors over the next two weeks. When you add sensors, you're going to make it situated. The moment you add motors, you're making it embodied. It's virtual, not physical. So remember that embodied and situated does not necessarily equate with physicalness. If you play a modern video game, your avatar that's running around in the virtual world, that avatar is usually usually has a first-person view of the world. Sometimes when you're playing the game, you're watching through your avatar's eyes. It's situated. That avatar can blow up other avatars in the game. It's embodied. It can act on its virtual world. Okay, top right, back to the question uh, a few minutes earlier. Embodied but non-situated. Machines that have an ability to push against the world but not observe how the world pushes back. I'm sorry? A rock? a rock? Good question. OK, depends. So it has an ability to act on the world, but it is not choosing. It, is not, it has no agency. It doesn't decide to act on the world. Agency is another one of these terms that's very controversial. It's like free will, decision making. It's like the Turing test. What exactly is agency? What distinguishes an organism or animate material from an inanimate material? So we could make an argument that, yes, a rock belongs in this category. But let's limit our discussion to things that have interesting stuff inside. They can make a decision to act. They just can't see the repercussions of those actions. Uh, like a missile? A missile. OK, yeah, something that's just programmed to do its stuff. Absolutely. Most modern missiles also have lots of sensors on board, but you can make a pretty dangerous and useful miss missile that has no sensors. Yeah, great, good example. Yeah, what, was there a rebuttal or no? Okay. A stoplight. A stoplight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Most stoplights are not really sensing anything; they're just doing what they do. Whether the cars actually stop when a stoplight flashes up a red, most stoplights don't know. That's a great example. Yep. <coughs> Anybody, anything that is? Yep, okay, so uh, Krishna mentioned an important concept we're going to talk about in this uh, class, closed versus open loop. I mentioned this before, so remember the loop is act on the world, sense how the world pushes back, cogitate, and perform the next action. You'll notice when I just described that loop, I started with action rather than sensation. It's a loop, so it doesn't really matter where you start. But if I was to ask you about any of the behaviors you perform, most of us start by talking about what we sense. I saw that it was time to go to class, so I stood up, grabbed my thermos, and headed out the door. Right? We tend to think about sense, think, act, which, again, biases our thinking about machines. So I'm going to challenge you in this course, in all the robots and all the organisms we talk about, to start thinking about the loop with action. I do something, and I see how the world pushes back, and then I decide what to do next. Closed loop is exactly that. It's a loop in which we can go round and around this process. As Krishna mentioned, anything that is open loop, it just acts on the world. It's programmed to do something that just does it over and over again. It is not collecting stuff back. There is no closed loop. It's open. It's an open loop control. So if you write a, a software program for a stoplight or a ballistic missile, you're writing open, an open loop controller. You're programming what that machine should do. We talked about uh, industrial, uh, industrial robots at the beginning of the course. In the early days, in the 70s and into the 80s, 
Those industrial robot arms had no sensors because they didn't need any. Factories were designed around them so that a particular robot arm could expect a car door to arrive every 5.4 seconds exactly. And that door would be at exactly this XYZ coordinate. So as long as the arm gets to that point at that point in time, everything's good, right? Unfortunately, if you want to grapple with the real world that is constantly changing around us, you cannot be not situated. You need to be embodied and situated. Okay. Any questions about that or embodied cognition before we move on? All good? Okay. Okay, so we're going to switch now uh, to lecture four, and we're going to dive into some of the building blocks that you're going to need in this course. There are other courses at UVM dedicated to neural networks, so we're just going to touch on that today and next week. Uh, Professor Cheney teaches an evolutionary computation course. We're not going to go into evolutionary algorithms very deep. We're just going to touch on the basics that you need in order to uh, succeed at the programming projects. Okay, my apologies for those of you that are already familiar with neural networks. A lot of this is going to be, uh, is going to be a rehash. But we're going to build up our understanding of neural networks from an embodied and situated point of view. We're going to take our, uh, we're going to take our two Breitenberg vehicles on the left. Which two vehicles are those? The, the aggressor and the coward. They each have two sensors and two motors and two wires in them. We're going to now do something we usually don't do in this class. We're going to take the body and throw it away. And we're left with two uh, nodes. We're going to assume that those nodes are receiving values from the outside world. In the case of the coward and the aggressor, those were light sensors. So imagine these values are representing the amount of brightness falling on the sensor at that position in the robot. So the input layer of the neural network is a series of nodes. Those nodes contain floating point values that represent or encode uh, physical phenomena out there in the world. Just for today, we're going to ignore what's going on out there in the world. I placed little plus signs next to our two arrows, which we're now going to refer to as synapses, the things that connect neurons together. The plus is just going to represent, as it did in Breitenberg's uh, book, excitatory connections. So excitatory meaning that the neuron where the synapse starts, the higher the value of that original uh, of that originating neuron, we're going to take that value and propagate it along the wire to the output, uh, to, the, to the neuron at the head of the arrow or the head of the synapse. And in this case, we're going to do nothing uh, more complicated than just copy that value over. So that's an excitatory connection. When we talk about synapses, a synapse always has two neurons, the one at the base of the arrow and the one at the head of the, narrow, uh, uh, the, head of the arrow. The one at the base of the arrow, we're going to refer to as the presynaptic neuron. And the neuron that is at the head of the arrow, at the head of the synapse, we're going to refer to as the postsynaptic neuron. OK, just a little bit of terminology for you. In the, in the case of the aggressor, this is basically what we're seeing in the top right, right? More light falling on the top right means there's a larger value arriving at the bottom left neuron. We're assuming that that output neuron down, uh, down in the bottom left here at 0.9, we're going to take that value and we're going to send it to the motors that make up the robot. So this number is going to influence how the robot moves. In most of neural networks, you've, you've, you've probably heard about input and hidden and output neurons. In this course, we're going to talk about sensor neurons at the top, capturing information from out in the world, and motor neurons at the output layer that are somehow influencing the way that the robot moves. We're going to start to add a little bit of detail. For any given neuron, it can have more than one incoming uh, synapse, like in this little cartoon in the bottom right. In order to compute the values at the output layer or at the motor layer, 
we're going to visit one of the output neurons, like the bottom left. We're going to go backwards along the incoming synapses. We're going to go back along the first synapse and co co collect the value of the presynaptic neuron for that synapse, which is 0.6. We're going to take this value and carry it forward again, store it temporarily in the bottom left. We are then going to travel backwards along the second incoming synapse to this presynaptic neuron, collect that value, bring that value back to this neuron. We have two values now, temporary values, sitting in the neuron. We just simply add them together. We're going to do the same thing for, uh, we're going to do the same thing for the second output neuron. If we took this slightly more complicated neural network and put it back into the body of one of the Series 2 Breitenberg vehicles, which has two light sensors, how does that neural network cause the vehicle to behave? It's going to move in a straight line. It's always going to move in a straight line. Can we be a little more specific? What happens as it's moving in a straight line? It can never turn. Absolutely. So generally speaking, the more light, the faster it goes. The darker it is, the slower it goes. So for, if we go from the top right cartoon to the bottom right cartoon, we have made a change to the neural architecture. We've added some synapses. And we can immediately see that that has had a change on the behavior of the vehicle. Right? This is the magic of robotics. You make a change to the neural architecture. You make some change to the neural network in general. And it alters the behavior. The billion dollar question, literally billion dollars worth to be made here, is to figure out for an autonomous car, an autonomous drone, uh, a, sh a snow shoveling robot, which, which changes should be made to the neural network controller of that machine to get it to do a better job at whatever it is that we want it to do. Okay. All right, let's add a little bit uh, more detail back in. Um, you could see that in the bottom right cartoon, the values that are arriving at the output layer are above 1. Usually in a neural network, for all the neurons, we're going to set a predefined range. We don't want values to go above this value, and we don't want values to, uh, above this threshold, and we don't want values to go below this threshold. So usually, in addition to tagging pluses and minuses onto our synapses, we also, uh, we also are going to assign to each neuron an activation function. So once we've taken all the values that are arriving, uh, sorry, I got this out of order. Before we talk about activation functions, let's talk about synaptic weights. Again, for many of you, this is a little bit remedial, but bear with me. In the Breitenberg ve vehicle, he talks mostly about pluses and minuses. So minuses are inhibitory connections. So an inhibitory synapse, uh, let's, I don't have any on my slide here. Uh, let's just jump to the floating point values over here. An inhibitory synapse has a negative value associated with it. The negative value uh, is going to influence the postsynaptic neuron in a specific way. The stronger that the presynaptic neuron is firing, the more it inhibits the postsynaptic neuron. If we have a little plus or a positive value, if we have an excitatory synapse, then the stronger the presynaptic neuron fires for that synapse, the stronger the postsynaptic neuron fires. Okay. Usually in neural networks, we're uh, assigning to all of our synapses floating point values that can be positive or negative. Positive floating point values are excitatory. Negative floating point values are inhibitory. I just talked you through how we compute the value of a postsynaptic neuron. We travel upstream to all of its synapses, co collect all the values of the presynaptic neurons, bring them back to the neuron, and, and add them up. When we start to add weights to our synapses, those weights modulate the influence that every neuron, every neuron's presynaptic neurons have on it. So in this cartoon example here, let's start, with, let's start with this neuron down here. We travel back along the 0.8 synapse. We collect 0.6, and we travel forward, and we multiply 0.6 
by the weight of influence of the synapse, which is 0.8. We store that number temporarily. We travel backwards along the other incoming synapse to that neuron. We grab the value of that presynaptic neuron, which is 0.9. We multiply it by the weight of the influence of that synapse, which is 0.9, and we store it there, and we sum up those, we sum up those two multiplications. When we're computing the value of a neuron, we're visiting each of the presynaptic neurons in turn and computing, computing the weighted sum. What are the values of those presynaptic neurons, and how much do the, each of those presynaptic neurons influence the new value of the postsynaptic neuron? We're describing the, the very lowest level of uh, neural networks and deep uh, neural networks. This is the basic algorithm that drives all of AI at the moment. Okay. The last piece of the puzzle, as I just mentioned uh, earlier, is we often want to clamp the values of all the neurons to lie, between, to lie within some range. Uh, there's various reasons we want to do that. In the case of robotics, Remember that the values arriving at the output layer are commands that are going to the motors. Uh, those commands, in the simplest case, can simply be treated as newtons. They're the amount of force that the motor should apply to the robot. Obviously, any given motor cannot apply infinite force, so we would probably scale that value to the maximum allowable force that a motor can uh, output. For our purposes in neural networks, we can choose different kinds of activation functions. Uh, in AI, AI researchers love to talk about their favorite activation function. There was a big flurry of excitement in AI a couple of years back about a new activation function called the Rectified Linear Unit, or RELU. Some of you may have heard this before. That seemed to make neural networks work better. Okay, we're not gonna go into the, the why of that. An activation function, which we're going to represent with a sigma, we're going to apply the activation function after we've computed the weighted sum that's arriving at the, uh, that's arriving at the postsynaptic neuron. And it's going to squash those values so that they lie between some desired range uh, again. In the programming projects you're going to do, we're going to be mostly working with hinge joints that rotate connected links together. The values that are arriving at the motor neurons in your robot's neural network, we're going to treat those as desired angles. A, a value of minus 30 would mean that the neural network wants the joint to rotate to minus 30. A value of plus 30 means that the neural network wants that joint to rotate to plus 30. We can treat those values as forces, desired angles, desired velocities, doesn't really matter. Whatever that, those values are, we need to squash them to a given uh, range. Uh, in the programming projects, we're going to use the threshold logic. So if the weighted sum, which we're representing here as x, if the weighted sum uh, lies between 0 and 1, we're going we're to start with the range 0 uh, to 1. If it's in that, the weighted sum is in that range, we're all good. If the value is below zero, we're going to set the value of the postsynaptic neuron to zero. If the weighted sum is above one, we're going to set the value of the postsynaptic neuron to one. Okay. Any questions about that before we go on? Okay. Sorry, very, very basic stuff about how a neural network works. It's important to remember that regardless of whether we're talking about deep networks or neural networks that are controlling robots. Essentially, what a neural network is doing, no matter how big and complicated it is, it's computing a function. The input to the function is the values arriving at the input layer, and the output of the function, or the output of the neural network, is the value or values arriving at the output layer. Back in the 1980s, when neural networks were just being built, there was a lot of interest in taking a given function and figuring out a neural network to compute that function. So let's start with something very simple. Let's take the, the following truth table that you see in the top right. We're going to work with a very, very simple uh, neural network that has just two input neurons and one output neuron, and you can see how it's wired up. We're going to assume that the input values are not floats, they're binary values. 
Because we have two binary input neurons, there's a total of four possible patterns that can arrive at the input layer. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. We want, when the, this neural network is presented with each of those four patterns, to produce 0 in the first case, 0 in the second case, 0 in the third case, and 1 in the fourth case. What Boolean function is this? And. This is the AND function. So we're going to try and write down a neural network that computes the AND function. I've already done half the work for you by building the architecture. To finish off this neural network on the left, we need three parameters. We need the weight of the left-hand synapse, the weight of the right-hand synapse, and here's our little activation da function down here. We're going to need a third number, which is the threshold. If x is above this threshold, we'll set the output neuron to 1. If the weighted sum of x is below this threshold, we'll set the output neuron to 0. What are those three numbers? What three, ve what three numbers would you pick that will cause this neural network to turn 0, 0 into 0, 0, 1 into 0, 1, 0 into 0, and 1, 1 into 1? Any ideas? Yep. 0 0.5 for, for which parts? Sorry? To make it one. To make it one. So 0.5, but where are we placing the 0.5 here? We need three numbers. Yeah, the weights? Okay, so let's set both weights to 0.5. So we can work our way through this. If we plug in 0, 0, 0 0.5, 0 times 0 0.5 plus 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. Okay, that looks good. We still need the third value, which is the threshold. What's the value for the threshold? Okay, let's set the threshold to 0.5. Let's set all three values to 0.5. So 0 times 0 0.5 plus 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. 0 is less, 0 is less than 0.5. So we set the output neuron to 0. We got that one correct, right? You can plug in 0, 1. 0 times 0. 0.5 plus 1 times 0. 0.5 is 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 is uh, x, uh, x is 0. 0.5. x is less than or equal to 0. 0.5. So we're going to set that value to 0. 2 out of 2. So far, so good. We'll skip the third one. Let's go to the fourth one. We're going to plug in 1, 1 at the input layer. 1 times 0. 0.5 plus 1 times 0. 0.5 is 1. 1 is greater than our threshold of 0. 0.5, so we set the output neuron to 1. That's it. So 0. 0.5, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.5 will turn the neural network in, on the left into a neural network that computes the AND function. Is that the only answer? Are there other triplets that will also work? Point 0.5, point 0.5, and a threshold of 0.9 will also work. There's an infinite set of triplets in the space of all real values that will work. Imagine we have a search process that is moving along through the space of all possible floating point triplets, and it is looking for triplets that will produce the AND function. The majority of real values, the majority of all possible triplets, will not produce the AND function. It's actually, in this space of real values, a needle in the haystack problem, right? There are relatively few choices that will produce the function you want. Okay. The OR function. Same neural architecture, but now we're going to choose different weights and a different threshold to produce the OR function. Ideas? Absolutely, right? The easiest thing and what most people stumble across is let's keep the same weights, 0.5 and 0.5, and we're
and we'll just lower the threshold to below 0.5, which means if either of the input neurons is one, the value, raw sum, the weighted sum at the output neuron will be above the threshold and it'll be set to one. No problem, right? Same issue here. Now again, in the space of all possible triplets of reals, there is, there's still an infinite number of them, but they are still a vanishingly small minority in the space of all possible triplets of reals, right? Imagine a search process that is searching for triplets that produce the OR function. Okay. Let's take another Boolean function, the XOR function. What three values do we need? What two weights do we need? And what threshold do we need for the activation function to turn this neural network into the XOR function? A little trickier. Do we need to add another line? Do we need to add another layer of neurons? The answer is yes. There is no set of, there is no triplet of reals that you can plug into this neural network that will cause it to compute the XOR function. Remember when we discussed the history of AI back in the 1980s, people got really excited about these new things called neural networks. And Marvin Minsky, who later became a big part of the AI community, came along and said, wait a second, there are certain functions that this neural network can't, uh, that it can't compute. He wrote a whole book about it, and that book basically killed neural network research for 36 years until 2006 when Hinton started to figure out convolutional neural networks. This, it wasn't actually the XOR function, but it was along these lines. That argument and that textbook brought on uh, the most recent and the biggest AI winter that lasted for 36 years years, 30, 30, 35 years. Okay. Turns out that as you mentioned, it is possible to create a neural network that computes arbitrarily complicated functions. You just need more stuff. You need more neurons and more synapses. So bear with me. This is the last one of these we're going to do. We've added in an additional layer here between the input layer and the output layer, which uh, is known as the hidden layer. Why is it called the hidden layer? Because it's hidden from the stuff that's setting the input values, and it's also hidden from the thing to which the output neurons are being sent. In the case of our robots, the hidden layer is hidden from the real world. It's hidden from the environment that's providing sensor values, and it's hidden from the environment that's going to receive actions from the robot. Okay. Two input neurons, two hidden neurons, one output neuron. Before you start grinding your brain on the six weights that we need and the three activation thresholds that we need, we need to come up with a basic strategy for how to come up with these nine numbers. What's a good basic strategy here? We want this thing to compute the XOR function. What do we want these two hidden neurons to do? How can they be helpful? Uh, probably have one do or and the other do and. Have one, of the input, uh, have one of the hidden neurons do and and the other do or. Because if you remember your Boolean logic, an XOR function can be written down as a combination of an and and an or function. So what, is the, what are the internal guts of any neural network doing? They're computing local or partial solutions, and those, the results of those partial solutions are being combined by downstream layers, right? Okay, so let's focus on this left hand, uh, this left hand hidden neuron here. Let's assume we're gonna set the left hidden neuron to be our AND function. What are the three values we need for this synapse, this synapse, and this activation function? What did we just come up with for the AND function? 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.5. Okay, that's good for the left uh, output neuron, uh, the left hidden neuron. It's always going to compute AND for these four input cases. And the right hand hidden neuron is going to be the OR function. 
What, do we, what are the three values we need for the OR function? 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4. Okay, so we got 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 on the left, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 on the left. We got an AND, we have an OR. Let's do the output neuron now. What are the three values we need for this synapse, this synapse, and this activation function? How do we combine the values of AND and OR to get XOR? If you look at the output from an XOR function, three of the values represent, three of the values equal the OR function, right? The OR function also produces 0, 1, 1. But in the last case, it's different. The OR would produce a 1 here, but XOR produces a 0 here. So we need to do something different in this fourth case. Point 0.5 and then negative point 0.5 for this particular synapse here, which is coming, oh wait, sorry, we need minus point 0.5 for the AND function, which we had on the left-hand side. The left hidden neuron is computing AND. We're going to set the synapse coming out of the AND function to an inhibitory weight, minus point 0.5. It is going to try and shut down or inhibit the one that the OR function is trying to send to the output neuron, yeah? So basic strategy, we're computing AND and OR, and we're letting OR flu flow through to the output neuron, except in the fourth case. In the fourth case, we want the AND, which lights up only in the fourth case, to inhibit the output. Question? Yes, that would, that would, exactly. It doesn't matter, again, at the output layer, it doesn't matter about the two weights and the uh, activation function. There's different ways you can do it, but you need AND to inhibit the output under this fourth case. Okay, it's a lot to hold in your head. So here's my solution, but it's really worthwhile getting a blank piece of paper, writing out this neural architecture, and filling in these values from memory or from intuition to really drive home this point. We've got, uh, let's see, actually I've got it the other way around here. OR is over here, OR is on the left, AND is on the right. Remember that the AND neuron here, the right hand hidden neuron, is only gonna light up in the fourth case. And when it lights up one, one times minus one is minus one. And if the one that's coming from the OR neuron over here flows down, one times one is one, which is above the threshold, so we're in danger. But the AND value is coming down. One times minus one is canceling it out. And the raw sum in this fourth case, the raw sum arriving at the output neuron is one times one plus one times minus one. That raw sum is zero, which in this case is below the threshold. And that output neuron is shut off, set to zero. Okay, it's a lot to absorb if this is the first time you've seen this. Again, good to sit down with pen and paper and actually with pencil, erase and write in these four cases and manually write through how those pair of binary values flow through and convince yourself that it computes the XOR function. Then I suggest you erase all nine values here, all nine parameters describing this neural network and come up with another set of nine that also produces the XOR function. If you can do that, you've probably started to absorb the intuition of neural networks. Okay, I apologize for thrusting this on you on a Thursday morning. It's very non-intuitive. This is the reason why in AI, we write code to figure out these values rather than us doing it by hand. This is just a reminder that this is what neural networks do. They compute functions. Okay. Uh, so let me just go back and forth between these two neural architectures. In the case of the, the, the simpler one here that has no input layer, it can compute any linear transformation from input to output. The moment we add an output layer or multiple output layers, 
Now we can set weights and activation thresholds to compute arbitrary functions, linear and nonlinear transformations. Why does that matter for robotics? Remember that the input are sensor values and the output are motor values. So the robot needs to be able to do different stuff. It needs to be able to act differently under different sensory input. If a neural network controlling a robot has no hidden layer, there is a restricted number of ways in which the robot can act in response to what it's sensing. The minute we add an, a hidden layer to our neural network controlling the robot, now it's more flexible. Now it's free to do different things, more different things in response to changes to its sensorium, to what it's sensing. Yeah? One of the interesting things you can play around with in your final project is try and evolve a robot to do something simple like walk or jump, which is kind of the embodied equivalent of and and or, simple things. Then try and change your evolutionary algorithm to select for more complex behaviors. The robot goes towards round objects and walks away from cubes or edged objects. How complex a neural network controller does your robot need in order to do that? Kind of a fun thing to, to play around with. Okay. The answer is I don't know and nobody knows. It's very difficult to determine what is the amount of neural machinery a machine needs in order to be a safe autonomous car, to be a safe drone, to do what you want it to do safely. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, designing a neural network. What if the neural network doesn't do what we want it to do? So here's an example of uh, uh, here's an example of a neural network on the left. We're going to assume now that we have a truth table that has two output values. So for every pair of binary inputs, there should be a, a corresponding pair of outputs that we want. Let's assume that when the neural network receives as input zero and one. We want the output to be one and zero. We, we've been lazy and we've set the four weights in this neural network to be one, and we got lucky. One of these, the, the first output neuron is producing what we want, it's producing a one, but the second output neuron, which is supposed to be producing a zero, is producing a one instead. So we got half of the answer right. How do we fix this neural network? so that when it's presented with 0, 1, it outputs uh, 1, 0. The way that we normally do this is we walk along the output layer and we see where the error is. In the case of the first output neuron, there's no error. In the case of the second neuron, there is some error. So we now start walking backwards along the synapses. We now go from the output layer upstream towards the input layer, and as we go, we're going to change these synapses. We know where the problem is. The problem is at the lower right. So we know that it's the two synapses on the right that are the problem. They're the ones that are contributing to the lower right neuron. They're the ones that need to be fixed. So we're localizing the error and then fixing it as we flow from the output towards the back, towards the front. We're not fixing all neurons as we go. We're localizing the problem and fixing things just there. We're applying tweezers to the neural network to fix it. This is the backpropagation of error algorithm, which again is the master algorithm in all AI. It's gotten very sophisticated over the years, but basically that's exactly what uh, your AI is doing or your neural network is doing when it's learning. It's backpropagating error and fixing things and then flowing forward again to check to see things got better. If they didn't or they're still wrong, flow backwards, backpropagate error, go forward to make predictions or classification, back, for, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. Okay. There's a problem with this, however. Um, in this case, we were just focusing on the weights. We were ignoring the activation thresholds, and we were ignoring the architecture altogether. We were changing weights. We weren't changing neural architecture. What happens if we get the neural architecture wrong? Problems happen. Okay, in this cartoon example here, we're going to assume that the truth table or this binary matrix on the left is actually real data from the real world. We collaborate with some folks over in the hospital and they give us the following spreadsheet where every row corresponds to a patient 
and every column corresponds to some symptoms reported by that patient. The final column is whether or not they had COVID. Obviously, let's use COVID as an example, right? What are the subsets of symptoms that seem to predict or associate with a positive COVID test? Yeah, okay. Can be pretty complicated. So instead of us or the doctors trying to figure out which subsets of symptoms produce COVID, let's train a neural network to learn this relationship from symptoms and presentation of disease. Let's assume that we fixed the neural architecture, but we chose poorly. In our input layer here, we have K input neurons corresponding to each of the possible K symptoms. And we have a single output neuron, which is gonna light up one if the neural network thinks that that particular patient has COVID or not. Let's assume that we pick a very large hidden layer. We pick N hidden neurons and we had N patients. Okay, it's not clear why we would pick such a large hidden uh, layer, but let's assume that we do. And we do this back propagation of error trick. When we plug in the symptoms for a given uh, person and we propagate that value forward, if the output neuron says, yes, I think they had COVID, and the answer actually was, yes, they had COVID, there's no error, and we don't back propagate error. If the person actually tested positive for COVID, but the neural network predicted that they didn't, the neural network made a mistake and we we're gonna propagate error backwards and fix some of these synapses. What would likely happen in this case is that uh, like, uh, like a student that didn't study for the math exam uh, and it's now the night before and there's no time to learn all the material from the course, what do you do? you memorize the exams from previous years, assuming you can get your hand on them, hands on them. Neural networks will tend to do the same thing if they have the wrong neural network architecture. You can work it out for yourself, but what this neural network can do is actually, uh, like we did with the AND and OR when we built up to the XOR function, the hidden neurons can compute or memorize uh, can compute or memorize the symptoms for each individual patient and remember whether that patient had COVID or not and instead learn to recognize, oh, 100, zero, zero, that's patient one. And patient one did have COVID, so I'm going to pass this one along to the output layer. And all the other uh, N minus one hidden neurons are going to say, that's patient one, but I don't know about patient one. I'm going to just set myself to zero. I'm going to stay out of the discussion. So you can get a neural network to, to memorize each of these patients and then just report whether they had COVID or not. This is known as overfitting and it's problematic because now if we give this neural network to the hospital and use it for them to try and triage who they're going to, uh, who they're going to work with uh, in the emergency room, if we take patient N minus one arriving at the ER and we plug into our neural network the symptoms of patient N plus one, what is this neural network gonna do? If you only memorize past exams from past years, but the professor doesn't use a past exam, he or she makes up a new exam, you're out of luck, right? You haven't learned the underlying relationships or patterns in that class. Same thing with here. Okay, this is just a reminder for us in this course that we need to carefully choose not just synaptic weights, but we need to also choose the architecture carefully for neural networks. Knowing how to set the weights properly is a solved problem. The back propagation of error algorithm works perfectly fine. How do you choose the right neural architecture for a given problem? The short answer is nobody knows. Okay, uh, I think we'll leave things there for today. You have a quiz due uh, tonight. You're working on assignment two. Have a good rest of your week. I'll see you next Tuesday.